way back when under the same umbrella. All descendants of Noah. Okay. It, is an, it is a fact that stands for eternity that we all come from the same root. So why do different cultures come out in this way? That's for a future discussion. Tower of Babel, perhaps. Huh? Tower of Babel, perhaps. But, but Noah, that's, Noah is even preceding that by... Um, by something like 300 years. Actually. So the Jewish people didn't really exist in Tao Montoro. Well, I mean, as and in the Jewish law sense, right. although there were the 12 tribes of Israel, but again, see, I, I don't want to, you know, okay. I don't want to get the Q&A, I want to get to the information I want to present because this information is hopefully going to be the stepping stone for all of us, including myself, because you you know, Rambam says, was the great, one of the great scholars of the Jewish people, once a person learns the whole Torah, what's the only conclusion he and I'll say she, she can come to? Because I know nothing. Because there's always some, there's something we might have missed, even in learning everything else. Show me, allegorically speaking, the doctor who said he knows every type of surgery there is, and I'll say that's a doctor who is retired. You know, Sorry. you take, you, <laughs> or he's, he's, okay, now, Sorry. let's, let's now go to the very beginning of the Torah, where we're all on the equal plane, because we're all still embedded in the earth, because we haven't been created yet. The very first verse of the Torah says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So right then and there, we're being told, not because it's logical, but because we have a tradition that every letter, every word from the first verse in the Torah to the last verse in the five books of Moses is prophecy. So you cannot prove prophecy. You can choose to learn about it and all the axiomatic teachings. In fact, there are very long elucidations just on the very first word, in the beginning. But then let's go to the second verse where it says, And the, the earth was astonishingly empty, with darkness upon the surface of the deep, and the Divine Presence, or the Spirit of God, was hovering upon the surf surface of the waters. So you have two extremes here. On the one hand, the world seems to be empty and dark upon the surface of the deep, but God's light is hovering over the surface of the waters. What's going on here? I mean, if God created the world, everything's hunky-dory, but there's still no purpose to the world. Why? Because... No one's working this gigantic aquarium or terranium or habitat called planet Earth. Be just the Creator and the Earth. But we're we're there, but we're just we didn't have our souls blown into our nose to original man and woman. We're kind of hanging out there. We're in the dirt. So there is a verse, a prophetic verse. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, 42, verse 18, the world was not created to be empty or chaotic, but it was meant to be settled. And that is where, as the Lubavitcher would emphasize time after time after time, is connected to the relationship between all human beings, that all human beings, we are the stewards of the earth. And there's different levels of stewardship. However, before we talk about the stewardship, we have to talk about what makes us so special. What makes us so special? I mean, you know, it's brought down in the ethical teachings that we eat, animals eat. We drink, animals drink. We have to get rid of the poisonous materials from our body. So do they. The thing that distinguishes us, which is later brought down, in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, where it says, And God said, Let us make men in our image after our likeness. They shall rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over the animal, the whole earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. That's verse 26 and verse 27. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So although it originally identifies man as being created in God's image, it also says in the, in the summarization of this verse 27, he made male and female, he created them in the image of God he created. 
He created him male and female. So there's no sense of male domination. There's no sense of subordination of woman to man because each one was created with this image of God. And Rabbi Nachman says that if you can get to a certain level, which I think most of us can intellectually, but just in our daily interaction we might get a little fooled at times, when you start to really going into a deeper thought process, you don't see a difference between man and woman, but you see that each person is just a human being. I'm not saying it's easy. Because there are the tests, there's the tests of this world. With that being said, now, if we look at the very interesting thing here, which, which is, I, I, I think I mentioned to Ron, I mentioned to Stacy before this, the Sabbath, the Shabbos. One of the things that's very important about learning Torah for all these new things is to see the bigger picture and then to see how it is presented on the microcosmic level. Now there's a very interesting verse here in chapter 2, verse 10, and the reason why is because there is a subtle, there is a subtle um, point brought out here where it says, I mean it's more obvious if you know the Hebrew, but in the English it says, chapter 2 verse 10, a river issues forth from Eden, the Garden of Eden, to water the garden, and from there is divided and becomes four headwaters. But the expression in Hebrew, and even as it's translated in English, is not that the river issued, meaning a past tense occurrence, meaning there's a river that's continually flowing out, I'm sorry, from, yeah, there's a river that's continually flowing out from this place called Eden or Aden. Now there's a whole dis discussion throughout the history of the, of the scholars of Israel, where is this Garden of Eden? Some say it's in the Middle East, some say it can be in Africa, whatever. it could be... We're not going to go there. That's, that's where I say, that's for you to do your research. Oh, it, research? Research. But what's that interesting, is, huh? Research where that Eden is? Yeah. But I can tell you right now from a teaching from the second Lubavitcher Rebbe, a direct descendant of King David and Solomon, that you can find not only the Garden of Eden within yourself, you can find the river that's within yourself that's connected to this verse. Because he says that any river must come from a wellspring. And a wellspring is related to wisdom. And we know wisdom, the wisdom side of the brain, is the right brain. And the river that comes out from the wellspring is where you have the congealing of the wellspring to form the dimension. And we know that understanding and also the thought process, actually let me pre preface this, the thought process, there's a teaching, I'll say it in Hebrew quickly and I'll translate it, your thoughts are constantly flowing from within you. There's two levels, there's the thoughts of your mind and the thoughts of your heart. We're going to just focus on the thoughts, the thoughts of your mind or brain. So this constant flow of thought, which the, the second above Trevi identified as coming from your right brain thinking, is flowing out to the left side of your brain, and from there it congeals into some form of understanding. Meaning, you wake up in the morning groggy, uh, I gotta wake up, I gotta go to work, I gotta do what I gotta do. But when your mind has been trained the night before, the days before, the years before, the decades before, through accessing this divine instruction, you're actually realizing, wait a minute. The verse here in chapter 2, verse 10, is talking in present tense. A river is coming out of the Garden of Eden, of Aden. We have a Rebbe, a righteous man with profound understanding of the, the secrets of the Torah saying this rib, this flow of wellspring of thought is emanating from my right brain to my left brain I have to use this energy just like people in, in the Canadian Buffalo area of New York are using the water of Niagara Falls for hydroelectric energy how am I going to electrify my day to use that wellspring of 
right brain thinking and channel the congealed understanding of my world. So now we realize every moment of the day, if we choose to contemplate upon these things, I'm constantly experiencing the Garden of Eden. And guess what? The Garden of Eden came from the earth. We come from the earth. So there has to be, we don't believe that just because you have earth at the North Pole and earth in South Africa or Jerusalem or, or Boise, Idaho, it's separate earth. It all came from the same sort of God. So that's something that you can never access just by the plain understanding of the Torah. This is from the oral Torah tradition, and it's from this tradition from where we're going to learn out the seven Noahide commandments as well. So you're going to see those same profundities in the seven laws of Noah. I give one example. For instance, we trivialize it and we take it for granted, but the very common stop sign that we see at the corners of the traffic lights are, I've promoted this for years, but you know, it's not necessarily acknowledged. The stop sign and the traffic light, or the slow down to 25 miles an hour in any city, you know, and I think the Blasio passed a lot for 25 miles an hour in the city driving, all of these are connected with the divine commandment, do not kill. Because if we don't have traffic lights, we don't have stop signs, we don't have slow down, people are going to get killed. And unfortunately, we do see accidents anyway. In fact, there's this whole campaign now you know, to, 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 to urge people very strongly, don't text when you drive, don't and don't text, text, you know, text on the cell phone. And also now there's, I, I, the latest commercials are more people are getting hurt and killed because people are less careful when they take left turns than right turns. But because we live in a secularized society, no one has the courage yet, although we can talk about it freely in a Torah class, saying every time you stop at the stop sign, you are fulfilling the injunction and you are getting the blessings for stopping because you're preventing someone from getting hurt and killed. See, we can, we can, we can trivialize daily mundane life or we can recognize it through the prism of Torah to say, hey, I went through a day and I didn't hurt anyone physically. And that's, that's something that's, and not only every moment, every second of the day, so, the majority, the vast majority of human beings on this earth are decent people. They have their moments where they have their, they slip it, they have slips in their consciousness, we all do. It could be in their thoughts and their speech and their action. But that's why we learn Torah to have us recognize in the moment that since we come from the earth and from the earth there came this pronouncement, prophetic pronouncement that coming out of the place called Aden or Eden became a wellspring and it became a river how do we fit into it in our daily lives? Is, is this a little bit different? Did you, have you, has anyone ever thought about these things? So you're saying that a wellspring of what the Mikvah the Rebbe said of wellsprings of, for the whole world is coming from the place of Gan Eden? I'm it's saying the place of Gan Eden is already is taking place in your brain. brain. Exactly. We are Which experiencing, is going bad. but we don't know. That. Just like the, there's a teaching in the Hasidus, scientists don't know all the treasures yet that are in the earth. Or the brain. The brain. <laughs> we don't. Uh, right. We say we only access ten percent <laughs> of, <laughs> of, yeah. okay. of our brain, or four percent of our brain. Okay. I'm told that's that's not uh, true. I guess I guess so. A movie called Lucy. Um, based on the premise that people only use 10% of their brain, but when I did some research... Oh, this is Morgan Friedman, you mean? Yes, yeah, however, that's not true. I didn't see it. It's, it's not, it is not true. It's, okay. However, what... I also have not who says met, it's not true? I forgot where I read, but I forgot where I read. I think it's 1%, it's not that. <laughs> you mean it's less or more? Much more. Well, that's another opinion. That might prove, course, that's uh, another, uh, that might be proven the, wrong the, in neuro, five neuro, years. I mean, every... Neuroscience. But what yeah, I did neuroscience see, changes all the time. Exactly. So a man went down to a tall tree in South America, and he sprayed insecticide on the tree, and lots of different types of insects fell off the tree. Mm -hmm. But some of those insects were unidentifiable. So there are more kinds of insects 
that man has categorized yet. <coughs> also, we see life that we don't understand. Also, we see another thing that, that fascinates me um, is the area of neuroplasticity, where people who have, unfortunately, have experienced traumatic brain injury or stroke, the old viewpoint of the human brain or human mind was that it was whatever your IQ was at say 5 or 7 or 10 or 12, whatever, maybe they, they give tests in adolescent years. It's just a static, basically, whatever you've been intrinsically given, that's what you have. But now through the, the, the wonderful field of neuroplasticity, you're seeing where people have, have incurred traumatic brain injury or stroke through various type of kinetic exercises that they can strengthen parts of the body that haven't been affected by the stroke or haven't been affected by traumatic brain injury and they can circumvent the damage that has taken place in the brain and do much more than they ever were thought to do. One example is it's, it's by children, I think it was at the University of Michigan, I saw this wonderful video where children who are born with Down syndrome ha seem to have a problem with balance. So how do you build up balance with children with Down syndrome? You start them on stationary bikes and eventually they can ride a bicycle on their own without the training wheels. So in terms of our consciousness too, we're only taught a certain amount of information. But wait a minute, there's a lot we weren't taught. And once we start to, with the, 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 the sixth Lubavitch Rebbe said that once you start to learn new matters in Torah, you're actually recircuiting, you're, re you're causing the, the neurons, I mean you're a nurse, you know, the neurons in the brain, there's also different chemical reactions when you get new consciousness. But what happens when that new consciousness is prophetic consciousness? Now the first reactions you get very excited, the love of Hashem, the love of God, and the fear of Hashem builds up. However, in order that it goes to the right place, that's where the knowledge comes in. If you're getting more energy from these teachings, then take that energy to learn a bit more. And the beautiful thing is, is once you start to learn and remember something, don't be afraid to, be, to, to repeat it in your mind as many times as you feel you should. For instance, what I call like golden moments in serving God is that I get stuck in a traffic jam if I'm driving a car. If I'm waiting on mine to, uh, to, uh, to buy some groceries. You know, and sometimes, you know, the, the grocery lines get long, you know, whatever. There's a problem with the, with the cash register. There's a difference of... But I can think about things I learned today or last week, whatever, and it's like it becomes like a martial art. A friend of, of Ron and I, Chesko uh, Siegel, told me there's a type of martial art where the entrance exercise is you basically walk in a circle a thousand times, but by that, after that thousand time, you're ready to do something much more complex. So don't underestimate the like the repetition of certain teachings in Torah, even though you have it in your back pocket, because the next time it can catapult you to the next level of awareness. And the next level of awareness is basically you want to be more connected and you want to implement these things even more into your daily lives. And we'll, we'll talk about that in, you know, pertaining to prayer in a few moments. So I want to start from Robert Rogalski's book and in the process of reading from Robert Rogalski's book, I feel it is my obligation to share with other people other books that will really supercharge your, your awareness, no matter who you are in the world, because I got news for you, ladies and gentlemen, the seven mitzvahs aren't just seven mitzvahs. And we'll find that out.